Okay, so this is part two of the lecture series. And in this part, we'll be looking at different examples of how threshold concepts have been used in different disciplines outside of medicine, as well as including medicine and psychiatry. So let's start with a question. And usually when we do this in the room, it's really fun because it's quite contentious and divisive, the answer to this question. So we have two mugs. Now, in both of them, we add, we have boiling water and a tea bag. Now in the first mug, we add milk right away. In mug two, we wait five minutes before adding about 30 mils of milk. At the end, which of the teacups are cooler? Which has the, mo the colder temperature tea? So um, I'd like you to just pause and have a think, maybe think to yourself, which one would it be? And honestly, I'm now going to reveal the answer. It's actually mug two. So when we wait and add milk, it's actually, it produces a much cooler tea. Now this is, this often blows students' minds because it seems quite counterintuitive. You might associate the idea of adding cold milk straight away with producing the colder teacup, but actually it's, it's cooler when you wait a little bit. Now there's a few people who think this is a trick question and that both answers are correct, but I assure you that there is not, and mug two is the colder tea. So this is the idea of the temperature gradient. And this is postulated to be a threshold concept because once you've learned this, this changes the way that you think and practice within your discipline. So for instance, if you were pursuing culinary arts or some sort of cooking profession where you needed to prepare food and food preparation was a big part of your course, this would change the way that you use materials, this would change the way, um, the order in which you put ingredients together, and this would essentially change the way you think in practice. And hence, this is a threshold concept. Now, it also meets the criteria of being troublesome because if you didn't know this, um, and I'm sure there's many of you who did, who you know are very well acquainted with the um, temperature gradient, then this can be quite troubling because this does, you know, you've got to sort of think twice and it may be quite slightly counterintuitive. And as you'll discover that many threshold concept examples are actually pretty counterintuitive to our usual ways of thinking and practicing. And that's, that's where the troublesome part comes in. So another discipline, economics. So the idea of opportunity cost is, uh, is, um, suggested to be a threshold concept. So if we look at the definition, so the loss of other alternatives when one alternative is chosen. So um, a common example in which this is used is when in this is a, essentially what they use in decision making. And economists believe that the most rational way to make a decision is by using opportunity cost. Now, incidentally, this is very much not biologically natural for you know the lay person who's unacquainted with this theory to use. So often if we're making a decision, we maybe we use a cost benefit analysis, maybe we use look at the pros and cons. So for instance, I'll give you an example. If you're if deciding to go on a holiday, you might think, hmm, I really want to go on this holiday. I kind of owe it to myself. I deserve to have fun. I deserve to see my friends. Um, you might think, hmm, I might be missing out on this important project at work, which could help me get promoted. Or, um, I don't know, I might be forking out money, which I could spend on something else. These, these are thoughts which might run through your mind. And so you might think, hmm, pros and cons, and then you weigh them up and you come to a conclusion. So this is, this is quite common. And, and often when I ask students to raise their hand, you know, we have a full room. This is pretty much how you make a decision. Now, actually, Economists believe that a rational person would actually make it in a different way using opportunity cost. So they would consider the loss of all the other alternatives when one alternative is chosen. So they would think, hmm, well, what about that laptop that I really wanted to buy? I'm not going to be able to buy that. Or they're going to think, hmm, that promotion, I'm not going to be able to, um, I might not, I might not get it because I'm, you know, out on holiday when I could be impressing my boss doing whatever. So these are all the things that you're losing. And hence, this is quite a, this is deemed to be a threshold concept for two reasons. So number one, it's very transformative because it does affect the way that you think and practice and make decisions. And, you know, of course, decision-making is a huge part of our lives. So, you know, the entire course of your life could be very different if you made decisions via opportunity cost than via your traditional kind of very simple pros cons way of making decisions. Um, it's, so that's why it's transformative because uh, you kind of think like an economist, which is a very different way of thinking and making decisions to an ordinary person. 
um, it's troublesome because again, it's it's not how we're used to, and it really does require some sort of additional cognitive burden to consider these options that you're not quite used to. So that's why this is considered a threshold concept. Um, so this is a this is a QR code to a paper which I um, did some research on about threshold concepts within psychiatry. So. Um, this, just, this slide is just to show you that I actually involved students in my research, so I wanted to find out from students as well as educators about what these threshold concepts could be, which is a really good way, I think, of triangulating your results. Um, so just going straight in, so therapeutic risk taking was um, a particularly shocking um, threshold concept that emerged, and students really struggled with this one. And I'll give you an example. So. We, we used an MCQ question. So 25 year old girl admitted to hospital informally has emotionally unstable personality disorder. Since admissions, she repeatedly self harmed through lacerations to her arms made with broken pieces of plastic, purchased two bottles of bo boxes of paracetamol and has not been engaging with therapeutic activities. So remember this, she's not engaging with therapeutic activities. She's in hospital. So bearing this in mind, we ask students how they would manage this patient. You know, what's the most appropriate thing to do? And we consulted with psychiatrists when devising this question to ensure that it's kind of, you know, what it would the optimum answer. And we found that none of the students thought it was appropriate to discharge the patient back to the care of the community. Instead, the vast majority thought to detain under section two of the Mental Health Act, which is extraordinary considering that that's quite a huge step to take, you know, in this case, and it's completely inappropriate to do that. So students really struggled with this idea of taking a therapeutic risk. So the risk is essentially that you can't say 100% certain that the patient is not going to harm themselves when you discharge them. However, you take that therapeutic risk knowing that actually the likelihood is that when they're in their home environment, they're going to recover as opposed to being cooped up in hospital where they're more likely to escalate their behavior with projective identification and all kinds of um, these things. So the outcomes are actually going to be worse in hospital. Now, students really struggled with this. And here we say, turning her away may seem like you are unwilling to help her. Um, you know, student eight's comment is also quite poignant. So I thought I may like to be a psychiatrist, but my placement put me off. It seems very hard to cure patients. Now this I thought was particularly poignant because the idea that, you know, curing patients, you know, it, it's, you've completely sort of not understood the idea of recovery and management of, of psychiatric disorders, but also it, it put them off the entire profession. And I think this is, this is what happens when you, you fail to understand a th threshold concept it can actually lead you to abort the learning process and kind of switch off altogether, which is quite unfortunate. So caring was also another part of it. So people often thought, you know, associate hospitals with a place of caregiving and home not, um, which is completely not true, considering that, you know, the community and being at home plays such a huge part in recovery and mental health. So, you know, not understanding thera therapeutic risk taking also impairs students' understanding of you know, the idea of risk and recovery. And these are the other concepts which they're not able to fully integrate. Um, diagnosis is another one. So this is the idea that when you're considering diagnoses in psychiatry, you're thinking about um, severity and severity of symptoms as opposed to diagnoses so you know often you know i remember being in my third year of medical school when you have a diagnosis this essentially informs your entire management but actually in in um, psychiatry if somebody presents with a depressive episode but you haven't seen them have a manic episode you know you might just you might initially give the diagnosis of depression they then have a manic episode and then you think, hmm, maybe this is more in keeping with bipolar disorder, but you would only know that through the progression of their disease. And so actually you would look at the severity and the persistence of symptoms when coming up with a management plan and not, not the diagnosis itself. So diagnosis, this is, you know, the bounded, which was the sort of fiddly characteristic, which I don't like very much, but that's the one in which this comes into play. So diagnosis is bounded within psychiatry as opposed to clinical medicine. And, and students really struggled with this so that, you know, they didn't like not having a definitive diagnosis. 
And finally, biopsychosocial models. So this is the idea. So students reel this off very nicely when you ask them the definition of the biopsychosocial model. But we found that in psychiatry, they weren't actually asking the psycho and social questions because they felt that this wasn't part of their role and their remit. So, you know, it's which is very problematic considering that, you know, um, things like housing, sexual history, things which are very personal and invasive are actually not personal and invasive in psychiatry at all. And this is what students found. And perhaps they hadn't internalized, they hadn't had that transformation that this is my role as a psychiatrist and I'm supposed to be asking these questions. This is very much what I should be doing. Um, and so they hadn't fully internalized that role and this made it very troublesome. And so they found history taking quite a difficult thing to do. So these are a few examples of how um, it has been used. And now finally, this last image just looks at all the different concepts and how they piece together. And here you can see the different links between several different concepts and several different smaller concepts. So this is the idea that it's very much integrated. Once you know one concept, you know, other smaller concepts suddenly come into play and it all kind of clicks. So next we'll be in the next part we'll be looking at the different things you can do once you once you've identified threshold concepts within a discipline.